to adapt the idea of containers to the indexed setting. Um, so, uh, notionally, it's just a sort of slightly fancier thing uh, than uh, the, uh, yeah, the plain containers. Uh, and it's fancier uh, in two ways. Firstly, instead of just defining one node structure, we're going to define a family of node structures. And that family is going to be indexed by this J parameter. Um, uh, and moreover, instead of just allowing one kind of element sitting in the positions, we're going to allow a bunch of different kinds of elements indexed by this I uh, parameter. Uh, often I use O for J. Now, o because I think of I as input indices and O as output indices. But then I need to use a little O to stand for an individual, but little O is composition, so sorry folks. Uh, uh, so it's uh, uh, so it's I for input and J for judge put. Uh, uh, okay, uh, but yeah, so J is describing it, the structure as a whole, and I is describing the elements that sit inside it. Uh, there are lots of different ways to build, to extend the notion of. Um, uh, Plain containers to index containers, and I will set lots of exercises uh, in which I invite you to cook this notion all the different ways and see what the trade offs are between them. But I'm going to use uh, this version, uh, which is uh, championed uh, by Peter Hancock uh, because it has, uh, it has become my favourite. Uh, and maybe I'll even get as far as explaining why it's my favourite. Um, okay. So, uh, so what's changed? Well, first of all, you'll notice that there are three components instead of two. And, but there's still a shape thing and a position thing. Everything is abstracted over J. That's because we're explaining how to define J many different kinds of container structure. So everything inside is functional over J. Okay? Okay so far? Mm -hmm. uh, so for each J you need to know what the shapes are for structures of a, that kind. And for each shape you need to know what the positions are. And once you know that much, then you need to know which sorts of elements are allowed in which position. So you have this other function, um, uh, which uh, uh, for uh, 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 historical reasons, I think of as R, uh, which assigns a, an input index to each position. Uh, when you take fixed points of these things, then, uh, then what goes in those positions are recursive substructures, and, and that's where the R is coming from. Um, uh, so then, we interpret these things not as set-to-set -set things, set-to-set -set functors, but functors from I indexed sets to J indexed sets. Um, so yeah, so what is it what, what do we get? Well, someone tells 
us what the elements are made of, and that has to be that has to go from I to Z. They tell us I different kinds of elements, and they tell us what sort of structure they want by picking a J. And then we say, well, in that case, first choose a shape, then for each position, choose an element. But the element has to have the sort that goes in that position. Uh, so uh, it's a uh, so what we've essentially got is a little localized type system going on for how, which things go in which holes. So we're abstracting over the rules for things fitting into other things. Okay. Um, I should immediately uh, give the uh, the kind of uh, the Hancock translation in terms of uh, commands and responses. Uh, and so here the idea is that uh, we're working in an interactive system. We're interacting with an environment and there's some notion of the initial state of the environment and that's what's represented by J. And our choice of permitted commands depends on the state that we're in. And then, as before, the environment, starting from a given state, when it receives a command appropriate to that state, well, there's a set of responses that it can give back to us. And as a result of that interaction, uh, the world will end up in some after state. And we're not saying necessarily that those live in the same state space. The after states are given by, uh, by I, where I is not necessarily the same as J. So what we have here, in, in old-fashioned terminology, uh, is a, a predicate transformer. Uh, if you think, I mean, okay, it's, it's very, uh, if, if you're completely uh, Curry Howard infected, you see something like I arrow set and you simultaneously think I indexed family of data structures and predicate on I. Yeah. Sets of some evidence, some, some useful data bearing evidence that I is somehow good. Yeah. Evidence that some condition holds. So what is this computing Yes, X is some predicate on, uh, on after states. That's to say, X is a post condition. Uh, and uh, what we are computing then is the achievability of that post condition. We're computing the precondition for achieving that post condition by one interaction. We get a predicate on the four states that says uh, oh, how we can achieve, uh, how we can get to an X that satisfies, yeah, so how we can get to some state that satisfies X. Because remember, what you have to do, you choose a command, you get a response, um, and whatever response that's allowed, you have to explain why the post condition will hold. So it's strategies for achieving a post condition. Uh, that's and you know, the strategy for it, the the strategy for achieving the post condition. It, that's that's the precondition in a proof relevant setting. Right to say, you know, I know. You know 
here's the precondition that ensures the postcondition is to say there is a strategy for achieving the postcondition. Uh, so uh, you know, you can get kind of worried that this is going to turn into kind of bizarre, futuristic, uh, uh, weird branches of abstract algebra that have never been seen before on the planet because, hey, dependent types, they're so scary. But whoops, we just discovered that we're doing kind of 1970s computer science, only it's about data instead of program logic. Uh, so let's, uh, let, let's sort of heave a, heave a sigh of relief there. <laughs> um, okay. So that, that's the sort of command response view. And it's a kind of compelling way of characterizing uh, interaction with an environment that actually has some, uh, uh, some uncontrollable state, right? We normally, uh, we do expect our interactions with an environment to be contingent on, on some property um, that is not going to be completely uniform. Um, yeah, so I mean, this, was, this is introduced uh, as a way of modeling uh, interaction with an environment. So this is Hancock's motivation for, for doing it. He was just thinking about interaction structures. It's one of these funny stories. That, so Hank uh, was, uh, was working uh, at home mostly, thinking about interaction structures. Um, and uh, in Leicester and Nottingham, Neil Gandhi and Torsten Altenkirch and myself were uh, we're thinking about, and Michael Abbott, of course, uh, we're thinking about containers. We've got a plain container story, just thinking about data structures. Uh, and uh, we wrote a grant application, or Neil and Torsten wrote a grant application, to study the indexed version, hoping to retain the PhD student, Michael Abbott, as a postdoc. Michael decided he uh, wanted to go back to working at Rutherford. Appleton Labs writing control software for synchrotrons. Uh, so uh, there was this uh, uh, there was this pot of money and this program of investigating properties of indexed containers, looking for results of various kinds. And I showed this uh, thing to, to Hancock, and he said, "But those things are exactly interaction structures, and I have already proven all of those results." <laughs> uh, so give me the money and we'll just do whatever we like. <laughs> uh, so it was a, a very good outcome. Um, uh, okay. Uh, but uh, enough of that. Uh, yeah, so there's a, a corresponding, as before, uh, where we took uh, fixed points uh, and got uh, W types. Uh, we can play the same game in a slightly more indexed way. Uh, and uh, you can see what we have here is uh, for if we choose an index set uh, J uh, and we have an indexed container whose known shapes and whose uh, yeah, if node structures and element structures are both J-indexed, then, then we can plug nodes in element places. We're, we're testing the right kind of compatibility. So we can take a fixed point and get a J-indexed family of types. Can you do something with the relative one that's rather than one that's given? Um, Doesn't that really make sense? Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I, I haven't... Uh, something of the sort certainly makes sense. It's worth unpacking that a bit um, uh, on a piece of paper later. Uh, but yeah, what, what's happened here is that the index container is saying um, that uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna choose yeah to make a tree of index J. We invoke the container structure at index J, which means this J is used to select the shapes and positions. 
Uh, and then into the elements, into the element holes, we plug more tree structures, and each will have to be at its appropriate index, as chosen by the function that you, the, the recursive index uh, function. So, uh, so this is uh, this is a very general notion of indexed tree-like data structure, which was actually around before index containers uh, posed by uh, Ken Peterson and Dan Sinek. Um, so they're sometimes known as Peterson Sinek trees. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, we have not yet seen a data structure, an inductive data type, uh, in the, you know, the course of these lectures, which cannot be represented as a Peterson Sinek tree. Um, and nor are we about to in a hurry. Uh, so let's just sort of check uh, that uh, some very simple things uh, nonetheless work that way. Let's build the natural numbers. Um, there's only one sort of natural number, so we're going to choose to the degenerate case of indexing uh, by one. Uh, so yes, yeah, so what do we need? We need to explain uh, the um, uh, that you know, for whichever of the one in the, oh, oh, I do my uh, I am not Swedish maneuver. Um, uh, so whichever of the one available choices you make, there will be two shapes. Um, and. Uh, Whichever of the one choice of index you get, we will choose either no positions or one position. Uh, and uh, however many positions they are, they all have uh, the only index they can possibly have. So thanks to the joy of the expansion, I can just tell Agnes to figure it out. Um, yes, uh, so if you haven't met underscore in an expression position, uh, that means I am not going to write this because you know what it is. <laughs> so, uh, and it will try to solve it by ether expansion and unification. So here, it's a function of, which takes three arguments and returns an element of the unit type. Job done. Um, yeah, that's, it's granted to fail if there's more than one solution. Yes. Okay. It's not like Axi, which yes. just uh, <laughs> you know, makes something up and says, there you go. And that's why you don't write it. But at least with Axi, uh, you confirm that you wanted that one by leaving that text in your document. Whereas here you say, no need for any text in my document because there's only one thing it can be. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, uh, yeah, so that's the, uh, the, the shape of it. Okay, so let's, uh, let's build zero. So these things, the legs would speed up if Axie was cleverer, but, uh, but it's not. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the same as before. Um, I can at least refine and refine again. And then I'm going to choose to go left. And uh, then that's magic. Uh, refine, refine again, go right, and uh, then whichever um, uh, whichever position we were in, we're going to put N as the predecessor, but there's only one, so that's all right. Um, yeah, oh, uh, just a thought which occurs to me. Um, one of the things I ask you to think about in the exercises is whether there are any other ways to implement these. I mean, here's one implementation of, of zero and successor, uh, but uh, uh, is it the only implementation of, uh, of zero or successor? I mean, 
uh, extension laser is not much choice, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot. Uh, Using lambda functions? Yeah, so here, for example, if we actually, rather than just writing magic in it and being done with it, what's the type of the thing there? Um, uh, if you stare at it hard enough, uh, you discover that it's a function from the empty type to the natural numbers. Now, although magic is a perfectly respectable function from the empty type to the natural numbers, I can think of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, kind of a lot more of them. Uh, uh, you know, there's a whole choice of constant functions uh, available. Uh, and goodness knows what else. Also, we could have the successor of magic. Uh, I mean, we you know. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, there are all sorts of. Um, I mean, because we're under a false hypothesis, um, uh, we can uh, we can play all sorts of ridiculous games intentionally, construct all sorts of stuff. But in particular. Uh, the, uh, the fact that you can write, um, uh, that you can choose any constant function to the natural numbers. You know, I can write uh, lambda underscore arrow 42. Um, uh, whoop, what's it? <laughs> oh, that's the, um, that, yeah, that's the native 42, uh, not the 42 built with these numbers. Uh, yeah, so I can then. Um, uh, well, I'll put magic back here, and then I'll, uh, I won't do 42, but I will do, um, uh, I'll need to do it.
unless they're parametric, of course. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, here ends that lesson. Um, let's um, uh, let's take our our, uh, our first example of uh, a dependent data structure, the vectors, and build that uh, as the fixed point of an index container. Uh, okay, so here I remember that we're describing the, the node structure uh, for vectors. So we're explaining not what a whole vector is, but what one node of the vector is. And the notion of child is sub-vector rather than payload of vector. Um, so the x is not going to turn out to be one of uh, the x is not describing the children. The children of these structures are going to be vector substructures. So let's just see if we can figure out how to do that. Uh, so yeah, so we need to decide uh, what the shape information is for a vector of length n. So the question is, what information apart from the sub-vectors is being stored in some node of a vector? Um, well, we know it's like a type is n. A type. So yeah, so we need to see, um, so what's the, uh, what information do we need to store? Element type. Sorry? Element type. Well, we might need to, well, so we also know the element, we know the element type. So the question is really whether, uh, uh, you know, we do we, first of all, we, given that we know the element type and we know the length, do we need to store any kind of a tag? Like a nil or a cons tag? That sort of depends on the length. It depends on the length. We have the length in our hand. We've got lengths. We don't really need. We don't need to store that. Okay, but there might be some other stuff as well as storing sub vectors in vector nodes. Sometimes we store actual element, you know, vector elements. So the question is, for any given vector node, do we need to store an element or not? Right. So we need to see whether it's going to be empty or not. So if we look at n, so now we're saying the shape's going to be dependent on whether we're making an empty vector or a non-empty vector. So if the length is zero, then we're just making a nil node, and the, we don't need to store any information. So we'll just choose the unit type. OK. Uh, if we're making a non-empty vector, then we are at least going to need to store one element. We'll put x in there. OK. So that's, that's taking care of the information that's stored in a vector node but isn't the sub-vector information. So that's the, you know, what's inside the node as opposed to the children. Now we need to describe, first of all, which children are available. So that's clearly also going to depend on whether we are um, building a, an empty vector or a non-empty vector. Um, if we're building um, an empty vector, we expect to have how many children? How many sub vectors? Oh, oh, zero of them. And if we are building a non empty vector, how many sub vectors do we expect to have? Some. Uh, well, so yeah, if, if we're building a comms cell, how many tails does it have? It's got one. Okay, 
So we're nearly done. All we now have to do is explain what index we would like at each of the positions for the children. So for each of the sub vectors. Okay? So we again are going to need to look at whether um, if we're building a nil or a cons. And if we are building a nil, then we get to say, go away. <laughs> there are no children to label, no child positions to label. If we are building a vector of length suck n, well, if I look at the positions, we'll discover there's exactly one of them, so it needs a label. And uh, uh, if the whole vector node is supposed to deliver something that index suck n, what length shall we ask the tail to be? <laughs> How about n? Uh, so yeah, so that's, that's vectors. And I think it probably would be a good thing if we just made sure that we really could build the nil and the cons this way. You'll see something that's quite nice, actually. So we want to know that for all uh, x, that there is, uh, what do we need? We need a tree vec c0. Oh, what have I done? Oh, sorry. That should be vec c of x. OK. Um, so what's going to happen, we refine, and it gives us a hidden argument. We refine again, and that delete the hidden argument. Um, and then uh, it says we have to choose a shape and a function from positions. And let's see what we got. Really, we've got to choose uh, a pair of an element of the unit type. Uh, and then, yeah, what's this? Um, oh, that's an element of one. Uh, I think we can let Axie solve that one. And what's this? This is a function from the empty type. Um, so, yeah, match it. Uh, what <laughs> annoying. Why is magic not working today? Is it um, I don't understand why it couldn't solve that meta variable. Uh, but it's kind of happy with that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then what else do you need? We need to know that that if we have an X and uh, We might be um, 
uh, using implicit function spaces uh, to give the type to the interpretation function. But if we look at the value it's producing when we interpret it, there aren't any implicit function types here. Uh, so when we write down these things between the funny angle brackets, we're writing down everything. Nothing's being hidden here. Um, uh, so my point is, in particular, that in this implementation of the vectors, we really are not storing, not even implicitly, the length of the tail inside the node structure of the vector. Whereas, when we declare vectors as an inductive family, we gave the cons constructor a hidden argument, that's the length of the tail. And uh, moreover, uh, the style of the thing was that we say for each constructor, which indices it delivers. So we look at the stuff that's stored in the middle and we compute from that the index that's being handed outward from a piece of data. Whereas the style that we had here was that the index was up front. We were given the index. It's the first argument of each of these functions. And rather than reading the index off from the data, we're looking at the index to decide what the structure of the data has to be in the first place. And that's why we don't need to store a duplicate copy of it. We have it up front. And if you think about what's going on when we have a, a type like you know, vector of a particular length, we do have the index up front. If we're, if we're serious about type checking as our approach to dependently typed data, if we're always pushing the type in, then that type will always tell us the index, which should in turn tell us the node structure, which should in turn tell us which indices to push into the subnodes. So the reason why I prefer Hancock's presentation of indexed containers is because it is in practice the way that it describes the flow of information in the process of type checking the data. You, know, you get the index, from that you compute the structure that the data has to have and what types to push into the substructures. So it fits very neatly into a bidirectional type checking. So that's, uh, that's why I like it. Well, so if you were to have the other way around, where it kind of stored these uh, sizes on the inside, would it be like having, I'm just guessing, like having, a pro like instead of I to set, you'd have products of I and set, or like yeah, what? Yeah, uh, so I'll set an exercise about this. Okay. Um, there's, uh, there's an alternative presentation of uh, uh, index containers where, uh, which corresponds much more to the way we make data type declarations in ACTA to GAT declarations in Haskell, uh, where you start with a plain container uh, and then you mark it up. So you give one function that reads off uh, a uh, node index from a shape and another function, the same as the R here, which reads off the, uh, the element indices from shapes and positions. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so this presentation uh, with uh, S and P and the function for which reads off the um, uh, uh, which which structure you get, I always call Q, because it's around about that area in the alphabet, and then R for the recursive ones. So you have uh, S, P, Q, R. Uh, uh, so these are known as Roman containers. Um, uh, but uh, uh, that's only the excuse.
disputes. There's another reason why they're uh, called uh, uh, Roman containers, uh, which is uh, a religious joke uh, that I might elaborate on later, um, uh, given sufficient alcohol. Uh, but, uh, um, uh, yeah, I guess I could say this much. Uh, maybe it will explain the joke. Uh, so one thing, there's one, uh, one, I mean, I like when I said it, all the inductive families that uh, you can write down, that we've written down so far in the course of these lectures can be expressed as a Peterson symmetry. There's one that we've written down that most certainly cannot. Does anyone want to hazard a guess what it might be? How will we turn that into a Peterson scenic tree? I mean, if we took this x as kind of uh, an input and had to say under what conditions some data existed well what would be the condition for being able to formulate data of x equals y <laughs> we would need there to be some evidence that x is equal to y and how would we what type would we give to that <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, what it boils down to is, uh, is this, uh, that uh, Peterson CNET trees let you define all the inductive families apart from those which make essential use of equality. And if you throw in equality by other means, then you can always encode any uh, inductive family because you know, even if you're not specifying the even if you get the index up front rather than coming out of a constructor you can always put an equational constraint on the index to say oh the index being pushed in must be equal to this thing that we would otherwise have pushed out yeah so you know, any you can have any index you like as long as, it's, as long as it's such and such. I call these equations uh, uh, forward equations. Uh, uh, after you, know, you can have any color you like as long as it's black. Yeah. So if you're defining, if you're defining uh, uh, colored model T's as a Peterson scenic tree, uh, you know, degenerate Peterson scenic trees with one, one node, then you, you take the color in. <laughs> Uh, and you say, yeah, well, uh, you, know, you can build a node, the shape information needs to contain a proof that the colour is black. Um, yeah. uh, if you're fortunate enough to be able to pattern match on colours, then you can pattern match on it, and if it's black, you can say there's one shape, and otherwise you can say there are no shapes. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, but more generally, to encode the uh, sort of general equality constraints is, is out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So once you have some means to equal equality, you can do everything. But Peterson scenic trees do not give you the means to equal equality. Which I think is a good thing, given that equality is such a controversial issue in type theory. I think it's a good idea to use a notion of data type which doesn't prejudice the debate about how to define equality. It just says, you know, here, here are data, uh, and plug in, you know, bring your equality from somewhere else if you want to. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's uh, yeah, a lot of equality and misery in the world. Um, and at least this factorization would put it 
and implicit is a rule. Uh, okay, not much time left. Um, what I want to do is uh, is hold up a hold up a mirror to the whole system. Uh, I also want to deal with these issues of uh, being kind of uh, overly overly functional when we could be first order. Uh, so I want to. Uh, to introduce some redundancy into our uh, capacity to describe uh, uh, recursive data structures so that we're not just saying sort of extensionally what the known structure is but so that we're saying in a little bit more detail how we're planning to build the data so that's this next thing hastily scribbled uh, is doing. Um, it's, um, uh, it's a type of uh, descriptions for known structures where the element positions are indexed over some set i. And there's a reason why I'm being very careful to do this in a level polymorphic manner. If you look at, well, if I uncomment this and load the file, you'll see why it's commented out. Uh, it's complaining that it cannot check that this definition is strictly positive because I haven't defined this operator yet. Uh, but if you look at what's going on, you'll see that one of these descriptions is supposed to deliver uh, an endo functor from i to set to set. And that doesn't quite get us back where we were, but if I've got a family of j descriptions, then I get a j to i to set to set which is the same deal as an i to set to j to set. So everyone cool with that? So yeah, so here, the thing that I'm keeping functional is the way the description of the data is computed by any means we like from the index of the node structure. Hmm. That's another thing to say, uh, by the way. Uh, and uh, I'll just, I'll make myself a little note. <laughs> um, uh, and that way I'll remember. Is that to do Yes. Um, uh, I'll it's. Uh, it's is it your one? Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. Oh, then you get this really annoying thing when you try and define the interpretation, uh, which is that the syntax goes to. Uh, there was a disease called Harper fuck, uh, the principal symptom of which is that you get fucked by Harper. Um, uh, rightly, this is this is not um, not casting an aspersion about Bob. I am uh, uh, I'm picking up on one of his favourite things to complain about uh, and pointing out why he's right to. Um, uh, so uh, let me just. We engage the ability to type check things. Um, oh, I'm actually called I equals C uh, D. Okay, um, so we've got some X which describes I index, uh, a collection of I input types, and we've got some descriptions which are uh, they're describing type structures. And I've, but, uh, uh, what have I got? I've got variables. So wherever you have a variable, that means please actually use x. And it takes, you say what index you want to use it at. Uh, so we say x i. Uh, then uh, for sigma and pi, you choose the domain. 
that's just the set, and you choose the way in which the rest of the description depends on that value. So if we want, to, so we're saying, please give me a sigma type. So it's sigma a, uh, and then you interpret d of a uh, at x. And then if you ask for a function type, well, then you can have a, a higher order thing. Um, uh, and then in order to, so that's so we've got generalized sums and products, but the products are encoded functionally. So we also would like to allow first order representations of pairing, which is why I've added a binary product. So that's uh, just interpreted as a pair, and it's also sometimes use, useful to have uh, a constant. Uh, I mean, the constant is often unit. Uh, yeah, we'll get there. Uh, so that's just going to be, oh, I should have called this, this A. Um, uh, oh, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to pattern match it, but I meant to give it. Okay. Uh, now, what I don't have time to do is to, I, I claim this was a functor, and in order to do anything useful with it, you actually need to implement its map over it. Uh, but, uh, uh, but as far as just representing data are concerned, well, I should be terribly embarrassed if this is still going to fail. But let's, uh, let's see. Yeah, now, now that it can see the definition, it's perfectly happy that we've done nothing that isn't strictly positive. Okay, uh, so now let's, um, uh, well let's first of all, yes, there, there are, are two more things to do, uh, in one of which the explanation of the remark uh, uh, can emerge, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and that's, that's to build the description of the vectors. So if vectors are going to be, um, a, uh, 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 a natural number indexed thing, uh, then we need to describe them by a function from nat to desk nat. Oh, we also need to parameterize over the element type. Right, now, the, um, the thing that Bob always picks people up on is the failure to distinguish the actual honest to goodness computational function space from the weak function space that's given to us by variable binding, right? So sometimes you're in the business of trying to represent variable binding and if you use a programming language function space to do that, then you include all sorts of stuff that don't correspond to syntactic objects whatsoever. And if you call that higher order abstract syntax, Bob goes nuts. And he's right too, because it really isn't. It's not an adequate encoding of terms. It's bullshit. Now, uh, what's going on here in our lovely syntax is the other way around. When we say we're declaring a data type and we provide these uh, not necessarily parametric things, this is some indexing information that comes up front. Our syntax forces us to use this information only in a way that corresponds to variable binding. It does not give us access to the full computational power of the function space. Compared to what's going on here, this is 
is your actual function space. We can really compute with this information. And indeed, let's do that, right? Let's compute different descriptions for what the vector should be like, depending on whether its length is zero or successive. And in the case that it's zero, let's just say, uh, oh, what happened there? It was capital E. It's not KD line. And uh, uh, in the case of uh, a, uh, a non-empty vector, well, let's just say that's going to be a constant x paired with a place for something with index n. Okay, so you can see that although I don't get to say, to read off the indices coming out from the data, and I get to compute genuinely with the um, uh, indices coming in, if I wanted to constrain uh, index information with an equation, I could just include one field that is uh, uh, is a node, uh, is, is, a, is a proof of an equation just using constants. Uh, so, uh, provided someone else gives me some definition of equality, I've got all the same bits and pieces. Uh, and hopefully, you can see. Uh, how you would uh, translate uh, a fairly typical data type declaration uh, in terms of this description language. I mean, you would probably want access to some sort of um, uh, uh, finite enumerations so that you could ask, for, you could sigma with a, a constructor tag and then. Uh, pattern match on that constructor tag to get the description of, of what comes after it. Um, but uh, this is uh, pretty much uh, what's, what's needed. And this is just describing things which are built with uh, sigma types and pi types and at each node one sort of level of, of wrapping. Um, so then the only other thing that I would point out is this. If you look at this data type, what are we doing? We're building a data type. It's parameterized by i. It's not even indexed in any interesting way. It's completely uniform. Uh, and we sometimes will pack up non-recursive data, some constants, and uh, we've got a little bit of dependency kicking around, we might need to use sigma sometimes, we've got some higher order recursive arguments, so we might need to use the pi occasionally. But all of the features that we are using in the construction of this data type are features that are describable by these codes. The only problem is that, of course, uh, the, uh, the, it's the size issue. We can't write this data type uh, as, so we can't write desk for level zero. Uh, we can't describe a, a copy of desk for level zero uh, in desk for level zero, but we can describe it in desk for level one. So each language, each data type of descriptions is describable at the next level up. So we could make a polymorphic description uh, of, so we could replace this type, desk, by the interpretation of a polymorphic description that would indeed describe this very data. And that is how data types are implemented in what little fragment there is of Enneagram 2. There are no generative data types.
has only, you know, the one mud of all data types, this one, and everything else is given by a definitional extension. Uh, you know, the, the type of description stuff, this type isn't included. It's just defined <laughs> to be the, the described thing. So that means all of our data structures are given by first class descriptions. There's no question of how to mediate between the internal described data types uh, in the universe for doing meta programming and the real external ones declared by data declarations because the external ones don't exist <laughs> when you make a data declaration which you can it just desugars into the construction of a description so uh, you know, so the object of the exercise here is really to take this uh, this tight checking view, just that, that the stuff is made of uh, you know uh, elements of enumerations and pairs and functions. That's the things that we model in a computer, and then that's enough to build uh, uh, to build the data, and then the type system just gives us a way to use some data as a representation of an understanding being pushed onto other data. Um, but there's no kind of uh, uh, new sort of generative way to invent new things. There are just ways to talk about your understanding of the stuff that's already there. Uh, so I guess from the slide. So can I write, I can't write desk in terms of desk though, yeah. with the date, with the sort of data interpretation because when, you, when you've got the, the brackets-y bit, mm -hmm. the, the level stays the same, right? So it's set L, your indices are set L, and the thing you get out is set L. Yeah, so, you, um, so if you want to implement this, uh, so what, what you can do, and indeed what my PhD student Pierre did in cock, uh, he, uh, he wrote a script where uh, you put in the number you want, the number of levels you want, you know, you type in 42, and it declares at, uh, at set level 43, a hardwired desk type like this. Uh, and then it constructs desk 42 in the hardwired description type and builds its interpretation. And then from there on down, it can do it all in software. You know, desk 41 isn't hardwired, it's defined as a description in desk 42 which is the only uh, uh, thing with the hardwired description. And you can build it to, to any level you want. So you can do that without any kind of tweaking about it inside the machinery. Um, uh, yeah, here you've got to sort of, uh, so you've got to break the cycle somewhere at the moment. Whereas, uh, uh, yeah, if you're, uh, if you're trying to set a system up which works this way, uh, then, uh, you have to cheat very slightly somewhere because there is something cyclic going on. I mean, I mean let's, let's look at this. You see, I mean, desk is being used in the type of data. Uh, so you've got to make sure uh, that, uh, well, the thing you do to break the cycle is that you trust that the implementer of the system has hardwired uh, the implementation, the description of desk correctly in order to be able to check that something is a desk but then you can at least check that it agrees with itself afterwards 
if you didn't have the, the candidate to start with, you wouldn't have a method to check a candidate. Uh, but, uh, yeah, in terms of being able to say, uh, yeah, does, does this approach uh, you know, actually have a model? Um, you know, our answer is, you know, tell us how many levels you want this model to have. <laughs> so, and we'll build one without cheating.